think uh, for for today for today because humanity is planning the development of society's space as uh, our technological development allows it now and uh, in this uh, adaptating we must take into account uh, all our experience for the development of our society on the earth as uh, the repetition of our mistakes would, would uh, now be distressous. Um, here we propose uh, to rely on uh, Plato's, as I read, ideal state whose uh, basic characteristics uh, were also adapted by Enlightenment years ago, uh, and as we understand, uh, not with a great success. But we must uh, note that uh, the West uh, culture have offered a lot to humanity, and now we must take uh, the next step, the next step to the space, to the society space to the cosmetic space, as uh, we suggest. But let's say what uh, Plato described in his ideal state, and all has been written about more than 2,000 years in uh, Politeia, the greatest uh, masterpiece, uh, and uh, completed uh, it with uh, discussion developed in uh, two books after that, The Laws and the Politics. So, Platonic ethics uh, is uh, a conditional of Socrates' ethics ideas. Plato tried to build the ideal state uh, according to him in uh, correspondence with the essence of the human soul. But at this point, the role of education in the ideal state and the close relationship that uh, according to the philosophers, as you are, exist between ethics and politics. And that uh, is very emphasized. Art is well known about, among uh, the Ocean Greeks, but nowadays also, these two concepts are uh, identical. So Plato's moral theory is connected with the soul and uh, the morality. Thus, Plato's moral theory enters into the teaching of self-realization. Given that the individuals during his next life gradually achieved his perfection, a kind of direct states, freed from the elimination of space and the time, and of course, physical existence and uh, sensory experience. A book uh, and the research uh, more than 2,000 years ago, Plato described uh, this case that uh, we are today. And today we have to make the next step, the next step to the space. Uh, but uh, we don't have to forget uh, all these ethics. I think that uh, the most important is to go back to see our mistakes and to start and make uh, the ideal uh, Plato idea now real, free of time and from the space. So I welcome you in Greece. Uh, next time, I think, I hope, I wish that uh, you'll be here and to, to discuss all that in the Greek symposium with the great food, grapes, wine, near the sea <laughs> and uh, we're very glad anyway Slava is here with us this year <laughs> so thank you a lot thank you very much uh, Nikos uh, for very interesting reward uh, for introduction and it's my pleasure invite our colleagues uh, Ajay Ted and Adam for your your words, your presentation, your video. Thank you. Uh, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, what happened? Where are we? <coughs> we have.
something has happened. What happened? Something happened there. We lost lost the connection. It's back in the background. I'm on. Why am I on twice? I seem to be on twice. Well, okay. Well, whatever. Okay. So uh, we are ready to show the video. What? What? When I tried to connect to show the video window entire screen maybe here can can people see the screen can ever can, can you people see the screen um, no not yet. yet no we cannot see the screen Ted. Yeah, no. can, you, can you see the screen now no we cannot see the screen Yes? No. no. Just your video without okay. screen. All right. So something something is wrong. It is not showing the screen window. Share a tab or, or screen from tab. No, it doesn't want a Chrome tab. I need okay share this screen. It says you are not allowed to share your screen. Um we have a technical problem. I, I think there is a question of control. It, 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 it's sorry, it's, it's a question of the browser only. Please allow that to control the session. I think it has to be done from, from Greece. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. If you could help us. Uh, it's already done, but I think that the problem in the exact browser. Adam, is it okay if you send once again a link, the same link? Yes, absolutely. Grace, yeah, maybe we will try that way. But, uh, okay, just... Um, and uh, if not, then maybe you can try. Maybe from Poland it's going to be easier to no, make it. Okay, the no. same problem, because uh, it's not, uh, we are not allowed to present this. Yeah, I think it's a question of um, permissions, yes. Yeah. yeah. Who, 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 is, who is controlling right now? Uh, it, you are I think it's, it's, it's desert in Atom. Oh, it says your mic is off. Mic is not off. Maybe you can try another browser. Uh, well, I find out why I have two of these. It's frequently happening in the course of the browser. It's not, it's, this is Chrome. Google should be happy. Sometimes it's necessary to reload the browser and reconnect. More options removed from the call. All right. I, I propose because we are wasting time. Uh, maybe Adam, you can start with your presentation, and uh, in the meantime, Ted, maybe you can figure out how to show this video because you know it's getting late. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe I will send later to everybody the link to this video. Uh, you can see it. So okay. Shall I start? 
Yes. Okay. Yes, please. So uh, let me say that, uh, especially to Professor, uh, the host of the conference, that uh, that I am very uh, delighted to join this conference, especially in Athens, the travel of the Western civilization that make possible this space flight and other achievements. A couple of years ago, um, I asked my friend George Zamka, who was the pilot of the Space Shuttle Endeavour, to take to space the CD with the music of Chopin. Uh, because uh, it was in 2010, it was 200th anniversary of Chopin's birth. At the same time, they delivered the cupola with seven windows. Uh, for the first time, they can watch the panorama of Earth. George Zamka agree, and he presented this music to his uh, fellows, the astronauts, and all of them, they said that it's uh, exactly express the emotions and the feelings that they felt watching the, the beautiful planet. Uh, this gave us uh, the uh, idea with George Zamka to present uh, in 2020 in Mount Vernon, this is historic home of George Washington, uh, we presented the educational program which we called You Are the Future. And I just wanted to present you the trailer of this program, but you will see it later. Uh, this is about the future of our civilization, let's say, about the cosmic civilization. Because for the first time now, the humanity will establish permanent bases, uh, first on the Moon, then on the Mars. And this joint explora exploration of space requires close cooperation between nations and civilization. Uh, as you remember famous words of Neil Armstrong, we have come in peace on behalf of all mankind. Uh, it's a question if we can repeat this now, coming back to the moon, if we came really on behalf of the all mankind, still we are divided, still there is a hate between different groups of people, in different nations. We are not together. We are not uh, coming to space on behalf of all mankind. And that's a problem because, uh, first of all, we have uh, from different civilization and we have different attitude to some ideas which we could not be uh, compared and, 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 and established. But on the other side, uh, this is a problem that, uh, that uh, was uh, stressed by Polish writer and philosopher Stanisław Lem. I don't know if you are familiar familiar with this uh, this writer. He's very famous. 40 million copies sold all over the world. In 60, 60 years ago, he said that we are condemned to technology. And it's true, there is no way back. Uh, uh, this is the only utopian ideas that we can come back to the state of let's say, innocence, that we can come back to forest and, and live in harmony with nature. It's too late, you know, just we are condemned to technology. And in the same time, uh, in 1964, he uh, wrote kind of most surprising and prophetic statement that technology is an independent variable of civilization. What does it mean? Uh, does it mean that we are not doing what we desire, desire, but what is uh, the achieved model of civilization expect of us? So we are very proud inventing different technologies, but uh, usually uh, it's not us. No? Just it, uh, of course we develop this technology, but we have no control on this. Our, our control is uh, not inadequate. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, especially about military technologies, which is uh, obvious. But uh, the problem is that uh, we cannot stop the technologies, and even if we take some measures to stop the arms race, uh, it's a problem. We can use only the balance of terror. It is shame for me. No, just uh, this is not for the first twenty-first century that we have to only to have balance of terror 
the mutual annihilation is a threat that can stop us uh, from making things that can destroy the, the, our planet. So uh, when we are going to the moon, we have to remember that uh, it, we cannot take all those problems and conflicts from Earth to the moon. Uh, this is, will be the nightmare. Uh, this is, will bring this uh, um, rivalization between the nations and civilization to the next level. So, and, and who can decide you know, just how to stop it? You know, just I think that uh, there is no chance that it will be politics or uh, some authorities. You know, just I think that scientists and engineers have, uh, have a say especially the uh, specialists in this, uh, like uh, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE. Uh, they have a unique responsibility for the uh, technologies that will be developed on uh, other celestial bodies. Uh, again, again, I ask the question, uh, uh, we should not, the problem that we should not bring all earth conflicts into space. And in uh, 1486, uh, Pico della Mirandola, uh, the famous Italian philosopher, and writer, poet, he wrote uh, uh, his speech, the Hominis Dignitate, that's mean on the dignity of man. And uh, this is considered as a manifesto of humanism. And he was arguing that uh, man is a unique future, that, uh, that he has a complete freedom of choice given to him by God. Humans can uh, either return to the animal-like state or evolve to a higher spiritual level. This uh, depends entirely on the will. Uh, there is no, humanity, there's no, bound, uh, no need for humanity to be bound to Earth. You know, just we can... Uh, Thanks, our technology can move, visit other planets and celestial bodies. There is no limit. Uh, Maybe the only mortality, our mortality is a limit, but we also are working on this. But the difference is uh, that this different situation is that on Earth we are living in, let's say, bios biosphere, this ecosystem, which uh, on, and on other planets we will be absolutely, completely, entirely depend on technology. Because of the distance from Earth, we, uh, it, it must be an autonomous system. And there's a great danger that we will become enslaved by the technosphere that is our creation. And uh, is it possible to escape this track? And uh, perhaps it's no co coincidence that this question is being asked in uh, Athens. This is the, the city of birthplace of civilization that took humankind into in space. And here in uh, 387 BC, Plato founded his academy. Here in uh, Athens, the greatest minds of antiquity pondered on the categories of beauty through goodness, wealth, and health. And it was we have come back to this, uh, to this uh, tradition and to today achievements, to this heritage. And Felix Konecny, it's a name of a renowned Polish historian and philosopher, and he was studying about half 100 years, less than 100 years ago, in the 19th century. He was studying the uh, old uh, Earth civilization trying to discover the formula that could describe fundamental guiding principles common to all societies and cultures throughout history. And he called this formula the pentonym of being, the queen codes, uh, consisting of five categories that are common to all civilization on Earth. This is goodness, true, health, well-being, and beauty. The first two, the goodness and true, belong to this spiritual realm uh, and uh, well, health and well-being to the bodily realm. And the link between the spiritual and, and uh, material spheres uh, is a beauty. And what is a beauty? Uh, another Polish poet, uh, romantic Polish poet, Norwid, he said that uh, the beauty is a shape of love. It's beautiful, beautiful 
say. Uh, and uh, the appearance of beauty is something that we experience both uh, through logical thinking and spiritual encounters. Uh, it's uh, present in art and in science. And beauty is something that we don't need to learn, it's just we discover within ourselves. But the beauty is a category that uh, is sometimes uh, rejected by scientists. Uh, of course, uh, many scientists and big mathematicians and physicians, they like uh, even Einstein, uh, discover the beauty. They, they say that the universe, the, 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 uh, the reason that they uh, make discoveries is because they want to discover the beauty of, of the universe. The same with Copernicus. He tried to discover the beauty of the universe, but on the 21st century, we forget it. You know? Just we are scientists, as scientists, we forget that the real, the real um, reason that we study the world is discovering the beauty and the harmony in the universe. And um, the key is that we have to present it to, to, to the next generations, that the education must be based on, uh, on the, 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 the beauty. The, the beauty is something that is different from uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, the artificial intelligence will never have the sense of beauty that, that human have. And if we will forget this, uh, trying to make autonomous systems uh, on, on the moon or in Mars, that are, if we'll, we'll uh, give the permission to artificial intelligence to decide about the, let's say, the, the condition uh, and the technosphere, we lost the, we will be enslaved. We will lost the place that is uh, given us by God. That we are, uh, we are the, 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 on the first place in is the dignity of of man. Only in this, uh, then we will be able to create life centered centered technologies. Only when the value of human dignity will be above all. And next. 10 years, I think, that will determine the future of the humanity. Uh, if we surrender our freedom and transfer responsibility uh, to AI systems and to the technosphere, we'll surrender ourselves and human dignity. And we human, uh, we are the only beings who are endowed with free will. With, uh, free will. Uh, our knowledge it grows like leaves uh, on the tree of wisdom. Uh, if uh, we want to pass this, uh, the ideas of beauty and love to other generation, we uh, maybe will create uh, the earth uh, a better place to live. Uh, because uh, this young generation, our kids, they are the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please continue. Ted, how, how you are doing? Ted? Please switch, please switch on. Microphone on, yes. Okay, can you, people can hear me now? Yes, we can. Uh, yes. We okay, let's see if we can get this presentation going. Okay, it says share, select a tab. No, I want the entire screen. Entire screen. Okay. I'm sharing my entire screen. Okay. Here's the video. Okay. It's now going, maybe. Oh. You seeing the video? Yes, very nice. Uh, yes. We, yes. Start, we, we see the... But let's check if the sound is... Uh, not seeing. It's not... It's... Ah, there we go. Okay. No. 
No sounds. No sound. Ted, could you switch on the sound? The sound is sound is on over here. I don't know why it's just stopped sharing. Maybe it's not sharing the sound for some reason. No. Well, let's try again with the sound. Because it's quite important. The music, especially the music. Yeah, of course. Very nice music. Uh, this is the prelude uh, by Chopin, the prelude uh, opus 28, number 7, and uh, it was uh, taken to space by George can, can, can you hear the sound now? No. No, no sound? When you, share the, when you share the entire screen, there will be no sound. Oh. Unfortunately. No sound when you share the entire screen, okay. Well, that's not so good. It shares the sound more um, so when one tab translated or one window. Yeah, it's not, uh, I don't know why it's not doing that. Yeah, I can't do anything with that, no. Well, we can try again to get this. For the, for the last time, okay, because we are getting late and I also I want, I want to have some comments. Yeah. Well, it's it's not uh, it's not sharing the sound, so. Okay, so go ahead and uh, do your presentation, please. Stop presenting, okay. Let me present then my presentation. Okay, I will send you later the links. Mm -hmm. To all of us, uh, of all of you, link to this video. Okay, so presenting my screen. Is it possible to open this video in in browser or? It's uh, maybe it's possible to open in a browser, but uh, you can see my screen now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, so I will present this. Uh, energy for space civilizations and uh, i will say to everyone uh, uh so uh, or um good good morning uh from uh, very early in the morning uh, here in in lexington massachusetts okay so the idea of this whole thing is um, since we're in Athens, at least virtually, uh, we should think of this in the context of Prometheus. And so we'll have a couple of remarks in that regard. Then we'll talk about applications that energy is used for many things, but these specific things are very key to making a successful space civilization. Propulsion, habitation, communications, computation, control, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance functions, utility functions, local transportation, and mining and manufacturing, and in particular, fuel and other resource extraction that's needed for production for habitation or possibly for, uh, uh, for, for uh, propulsion. And I'll give an example of the uh, MOXIE experiment uh, on the Perseverance rover that's currently operated uh, on Mars. It actually shut, shut the experiment down, but it, uh, it worked successfully. Uh, we'll use as a paradigm for this, uh, the Apollo program. And then we'll talk a little bit about sources, solar, storage and fuel cells, nuclear uh, and fission. These two are different because this one is, is really uh, uh, radioactive decay, predominantly alpha particle decay, and this one is actual fission, and then we'll talk about fusion. So <clears throat> with apologies to all the people who know much more about ancient Greek 
uh, than I do and such. Uh, Prometheus, from the Plato's dialogue, Protagoras, he contrasts Prometheus with his dull-witted brother, Epimetheus, or the afterthinker, <coughs> who gave away all the physical a attributes to the animals, <coughs> and there was nothing left for the humans. So Prometheus compensated by taking the fire from the gods and giving it along with the civilizing arts to the humans. <coughs> Excuse me. In the second century AD, or current era, <coughs> the satiricist Wu Chen pointed out that while temples for the major Olympians were to be found everywhere, there were none for Prometheus to be seen except in Athens and Athenian colonies, where Prometheus was worshipped in Athens along with Athena and Hesphesphes. Uh, according to um, Hosanius, who was in the second century current era, the altar, the altar of Prometheus in the grove of the academy was the point of origin for a relay torch race, uh, the Lampa de Foria, and it concluded the Panathenaic festival. The race passed through the Karamaikos, or the potter's district, that's where we get the word ceramic from, who regarded Prometheus and Hephaestus as patrons. The race ended by rekindling the sacrificial fire on the altar of Athena on Necropolis. So we have a couple of examples. This is uh, uh, by a, a German painter in the 19th century. Of pro, uh, it's actually an extract from a larger uh, painting, uh, <clears throat> and this and he brings fire to mankind as told by Hesiod, and this is uh, Heracles uh, freeing Prometheus from his imprisonment uh, on the uh, rock uh, that he was placed by Zeus. And uh, this is uh, from the uh, uh, the Temple of Aphrodite and Aphrodisia in, in Turkey. So the historical basis, this is one person's version, mine. Uh, fire provides earliest humanity with access to high quality protein, like cooking, and security and comfort in that you, you could warm yourself and you could keep wild beasts and stuff away from you. The cooking fires gave rise to the discovery of firing of clay by accident, initially probably, and hence led to pottery. Cooking in pottery led to the discovery of steam and was later fully exploited by Heron. Firing pottery leads to the discovery of smelting metals and forming metals and transforming materials. And all this then fired the idea of studying the materials and transformations and observations and analysis. Science is born. Uh, the person who is responsible, generally considered to be responsible for coming up with this beginning of, of uh, the, the natural philosophy is uh, Thales of Miletius, who was a pre-Socratic philosopher in Ionia. And he's credited with saying, know thyself, which has been inscribed on the temple of Apollo at Delphi. He broke with the prior use of mythology to explain the world and instead began using natural philosophy, first to have engaged in mathematics, science, and deductive reasoning. He estimated the heights of the pyramids, predicted an eclipse, which Isaac Asimov described as the, the battle that occurred when where the eclipse was viewed as the earliest historical event whose date is absolutely known with precision to the day <coughs> and called the prediction the birth of science. He did have some strange ideas. He thought the earth was a flat disk or a mound of land and dirt floating in an expanse of water. And he believed that all of nature was based on the existence of water. 
he also believed that lodestones had souls because iron was attracted to them. And the same he ascribed to amber for its capacity to attract particles of of dirt and uh, bits of of um, material because of static electricity. He was followed a couple hundred years later almost by Democritus, who was responsible for formulation of a atomic theory of the universe where he described the atom the not cuttable or atom of being indestructible unique to the substance he had some strange ideas too about how those atoms were constructed and such but he was uh, followed a little bit later by uh, aristarchus of samos uh, who was the first person to propose a heliocentric model place the sun at the center of the universe. He also estimated the size and distance of the Earth Moon system. He was off by a little bit on that one. Uh, he did reasonably well uh, come up with the ideas uh, how the geometry worked, but uh, uh, he had a problem with uh, estimating the sun being only 18 times size or, uh, further away than the moon was. Uh, Erastonus, uh, Erastonus, I'm sorry. Uh, who was a mathematician and geographer, poet, astronomer, and a music theorist. He also was the chief librarian at the Library of Alexandria. And he calculated the circumference of the Earth to a fairly high degree of precision. It was off by about uh, 50 or 60 kilometers. Heron or Heron of Alexandria, as in Heron or Alexandra, he came along a little later. He was the first real successful engineer uh, in the Greco world, um, often considered the greatest experimenter of antiquity. He built a steam turbine, a wind turbine, and other inventions and discoveries. He is also said to have been a follower of the Atomanists or followers of Democritus. And this is uh, his steam turbine quite a modern concept this is a sphere of copper and these are little jets that allow steam to be uh, expelled from the, uh, the sphere which is heated from from below here right. this is from a, a wood cut from the 19th century in the knight's american mechanical dictionary so, to the propulsion, habitation, computation, communications, utility function, local transportation, and mining and manufacturing. <coughs> this is perseverance. This is a functional version of perseverance that is in the backyard for JPL so they can use it to test things that are going to be actually transmitted to the craft on, on Mars. It's uh, otherwise <clears throat> functionally identical. There's a, a mock-up of Perseverance full size, but non-functional at the Museum of Science in Boston. I see every Saturday when I go over there to do my thing. Um, <clears throat> On Perseverance, in this location right here, is a little box. And if you make a block diagram of the box, it looks like this. It's sort of a, a reverse fuel cell. It takes air from Mars, which has got CO2 in it. And using a solid oxide electrolysis, it, it basically extracts oxygen. Oxygen is then ex expelled from the system. It requires energy to do that, of course, as opposed to the fuel cell, which puts out energy. So MOXIE, which uh, is an acronym for Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, uh, it's on the Perseverance rover. <clears throat> Main 
purpose of it is to produce oxygen. It weighs on Earth 37 pounds or 17 kilograms on Mars, 14 pounds or 6.4 kilograms. It takes 300 watts and it produces 10 grams per hour of oxygen, which is uh, enough to keep a chihuahua who is not being excitable, which is probably unlikely for a chihuahua, alive in a resting state. This obviously would not make enough oxygen to be used for human consumption, let alone uh, to refuel a rocket to get you off Mars in uh, the future, but it's a prototype of the idea. So if we look at the overall Apollo lunar flight, this is a good paradigm for the whole thing. Chemical rocket provided the primary propulsion. That's Apollo 11 taking off. Batteries on board here provided the electrical power needed to operate the Saturn V. The batteries also provided electrical power for the command module when it was disconnected from the service module. For the bulk of the voyage, the service module provided power from fuel cells. And of course, we had the famous explosion of the uh, oxygen tank in the service module for the um, Apollo 13. The, the lunar module was powered by batteries and the lunar transportation was also powered by batteries. Also on the moon was the Apollo lunar surface experimental package, which is powered by a nuclear decay uh, radioactive uh, thermal generator. Decay of plutonium produced about 70 watts. The batteries, of course, were considerably more capability than that. And uh, manual labor was used for the geological sample extraction and carrying the samples over to the rover or, or to the uh, uh, lunar module. Now, I included Skylab here as uh, part of the Apollo system, of course, because it, it was based on the third stage, unused third stage. It was launched by a Saturn V, so it really does fit into the Apollo story. Of course, there's the lunar module. This is, uh, that's uh, Buzz Oz, uh, uh, Arms, uh, Aldrin um, removing the uh, early version of the surface elect experimental package. This is a Apollo 17 liftoff from the moon. That's the only example we have of actual live video from another planet with a takeoff from that planet, or in the case of the moon. So here's Skylab, and this is after uh, some repairs have been made on it. Uh, the, each one of these panels could produce more than 10 kilowatts. And uh, the, of course, the piece over here is missing. So the Skylab was handicapped from day one, but it did succeed quite, quite well. Problem, of course, was that during each pass around the Earth, there was a period when there was no sun on the Skylab, and so didn't produce any electricity that period of time. So the average power available, after you included all the power that was consumed by the power conditioning and other things, that was about three kilowatts per each array element. There's the uh, command module and the service module. When the reentry process began, the service module was ditched. And so then the command module was operating on batteries only. 
but when it was traveling to the moon and most of the way back, it depended on fuel cells that were located in the service module. This is a diagram showing where the things were located. Uh, this is an actual spare uh, from a non, it was a flight braided unit, but it never flew, Apollo fuel cell. And this is the uh, design and the, again, flight rated, but not never flew, flown fuel cell on the uh, uh, space shuttle. Design is quite similar, not identical. So if we look at the solar panels, which we saw on the uh, Skylab and also, of course, on the space station, get a lot of power if you're at Earth, Earth orbit or if you go to Venus, for instance, with the efficiency of these uh, systems now up in excess of 30% in the best of them. Uh, you can you can get three to five hundred watts per meter squared. If you go out to Mars, though, it drops off. So at Mars, you're you're down to probably hundred and fifty to maybe up to two hundred watts per meter squared. Go to Jupiter, and it falls off like it's falling off a cliff. You're down to somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20 watts per meter squared. And then you have the problem of dust, shadows possibly, like what happened to the uh, little lander that uh, accompanied the Rosetta probe. Uh, the lander went into a spot on the, the, the asteroid and uh, the uh, comet, I'm sorry, that um, and uh, it never got any more sunlight. And the, when its batteries ran out, that was the end of the line. And of course, seasonality on something like Mars or, or something, or even on the moon for that matter. Storage and fuel cells are fine, but uh, you know, primary cells good for the boost phase, but you you know you can't have them for too long. Storage cells, you need something, of course, to recharge them from something else. And they're good for translating trickle charges to peak output. Fuel cells, the limit is availability. Fuel and oxidizer, typically hydrogen and oxygen. Side benefit comes from that is production of water. So what do you do when you're outside of the range where these things are easily available? Well, most of the time we've used nuclear technologies, either radioactive decay, typically plutonium-238 in an oxide form, uh, it uh, can produce 100 watts kind of thing. And um, it has a problem that if the plutonium-238 is not very easily available. It's reluctantly produced, very expensive. It'll work for about a decade or so, though in some cases, of course, it's uh, been operating on the Voyagers since the 70s, though the power levels are dropping. The uh, half-life is uh, 87.7 years. So in the case of the Voyagers, they, they're getting to one half of a half-life. And uh, the alternative, of course, is then you go to a nuclear reactor. You can get heat directly. You can use uh, direct heat thermal to electrical, or you can go via a thermo mechanical electrical system like a Brayton cycle or, or a Stirling cycle or something like that. A typical power outputs are tens of kilowatts or more, and it's good for planetary bases. It could be good for uh, uh, some uh, radar satellites, mostly done by the USSR, and it could power uh, either electronically or thermally uh, provide propulsion. So the alternative then after you go through all these is fusion. There's a, by the way, that's a piece of chunk of plutonium there that's uh, heating itself up because of the fact that the 
alpha decay is occurring inside it. That's glowing because of that. That's what it looked like on the moon for the uh, lunar surface electrical properties experiment. And this is uh, the radio thermal generator uh, on the uh, New Horizons probe that went out to Pluto. This was an early idea of a reactor, nuclear reactor that uh, the atom then Atomic Energy Commission, uh, now would be the Department of Energy, uh, proposed and they built prototypes. Um, at least one of these things did go into space. One of these things also had trouble on the, on the takeoff and ended up in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so um, they did launch them typically from the Vandenberg so that if there was a problem that you know, it, wouldn't, uh, it would go into the Pacific Ocean. This is NASA's current idea of using nuclear thermal propulsion. And it's an artist's conception. Obviously, there's no actual design at this stage of the game. You can see something like the uh, Orion craft attached to the one end of this thing and the nozzles are back here. The nuclear reactor is located in this area over here. And then these are tanks for the for the, the uh, material that's heated by it. So the question is, well, why is fusion worth doing? Well, because, of course, E equals MC squared gives you a lot of energy for a very small amount of fuel. And um, this is the reaction that everybody is working on right now. It's deuterium and tritium. It has a downside. I'll get to that in a second about the need for production of tritium. But uh, by comparison to a 1,000 megawatt coal plant, you need 2.7 million tons of coal per year. A 1,000 megawatt fusion plant would require 250 kilograms of fuel per year. That's a kind of a big number. Uh, there's a lot of available uh, deuterium. Uh, there is no available tritium. You have to make your tritium. And uh, well, there's a little bit produced in the, by decay in the earth and, and the atmosphere. Uh, but uh, if you use seawater as the reference, a gallon of seawater, the deuterium in a gallon of seawater, can produce as much energy as 300 gallons of gasoline. Uh, some of these are not particularly relevant to space fairings. There's not being much wind in most places, in some few. Uh, you don't have to worry about waste issues and there are minimal proliferation issues. But we've been at it for 50 years and we still haven't made it work. And this is a sort of a current view of where things stand over the last 50 years. This axis over here is confinement time and density. And this axis over here is is the energy of the ions necessary for fusion. Really, you have to be over in this region, 10 kilo electron volts or equivalent to 100 million degrees uh, Kelvin or centigrade or higher. And the optimum is somewhere around here, around 15 kilo electron volts or a little above that. This is the area where the uh, most recent work with the lasers has done. Uh, you heard about that may have actually crossed that barrier a little bit. Um, Q equals one is the uh, point at which you have scientific break even if you make a certain set of definitions. The goal is to get in this range of Q approaching infinity. And that's when you have ignition and you can use the energy as you see fit. Of course, you're still limited to a few things. If you produce neutrons, 80% of the energy in the DT reaction is neutrons. You also have to capture those neutrons and use them to breed tritium. 
and then you have heat that you need to convert into electricity. If you have stray neutrons, they're relatively hard to shield. Lead doesn't work particularly well and it's heavy. Water works okay. <coughs> the laser technology has one possibility. You could go directly from lasers or inertial confinement of another variety triggering a small little fusion explosion and use that as directly for propulsion. That was a concept that was planned to be tested and never really got to the final stage where they tested it with with uh, nuclear or thermonuclear explosions. They tested it with chemical explosions and it, it actually does work, but it's uh, obviously not made to work with chemical explosions. So the further example for exotic type fusion, not the DT or, or DD, is that you can produce reactions, only produce charged particles. And then you can go directly conversion uh, from the motion of those charged particles to electricity. Or in principle, you could gate the confinement and then use the high energy charged particles directly for propulsion. The advantage of all these high energy ways of propulsing is you can get from one place to another pretty fast as opposed to spending a lot of time uh, in the transfer orbits and where you're exposed to a lot of cosmic rays and things like that. So a sort of summary of this is the energy for space civilizations, the countdown to space civilization started in ancient Greece with the beginning of natural philosophy which led to robust scientific inquiry, and then the application of engineering leading to advanced technology. Fusion energy can be viewed as the neo Prometheus, the new Promethean gift, right? And it can be the foundation of robust space civilization. Just a couple of quick more pictures here. This is uh, Voyager, still working Voyager 2 uh, and Voyager 1, way out in space. In, in essentially in interstellar space. This is data from plasma experiment that's been operating well past its lifetime, was designed to operate through the solar system's uh, grand tour of the planets. And uh, it's well, well past that point now, and it's still operating. This is data that uh, was received a few years ago and uh, is past this point now further out, but it's still producing data. This is where it currently is as of uh, you know, Friday, a uh, week ago. And it's um, radioisotope thermal generator powering it right there. And this thing is, um, well, that's a Rodin sculpture <laughs> of the, the Greek uh, goddess who started off as a mortal uh, Psyche or Psyche. There's a mission that just launched a day ago uh, heading, uh, this is a, a more ancient Greek style version that's uh, uh, Psyche and her uh, her husband there, Eros. Both of these are in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston now. Um, but um, get rid of those. That's what the craft artist conception of what the craft should look like just about now. These are roughly the size of tennis courts and they produce at Earth orbit a uh, reasonably decent amount of power, a couple of kilowatts, but by the time they get out to where the, the uh, asteroid is located, uh, the power drops rather precipitously down to a few hundred watts. This is what it actually last looked like when you could still see it. That's the, it was launched by the Falcon Heavy. <clears throat> this is the Falcon right here, and that's the probe heading off uh, just after a separation. That's what it looked like when it took off. This is the path it takes. It uh, Even though it, it has a ion thruster on it, the thrust from it is very small. It uh, 
will use a Mars assist, but it still takes, even with the thruster and the Mars assist, it's going to be uh, three years after Mars closest approach, which is three years from now, essentially. Well, not quite three. It'll take another three years. And then it'll hang around for a couple of years and uh, do some measurements. These are the instruments, multispectral camera, magnetometer, and a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. This is very interesting because a lot of these type of things use a source, but this, the assumption is there's plenty of cosmic rays out there and they'll bombard the asteroid and uh, we'll find out what it's made out of from the essentially uh, emissions that are produced as, a, as it's bombarded by the cosmic rays. Now, this is the thruster in the in a vacuum chamber in the laboratory. That's what it looks like. And uh, the artist's conception, that's what it looks like. There's on board this thing, there's one more a little bit here. There's a deep space optical communications experiment. Optical communications have been used in the distances out to the moon. And in fact, um, as um, was pointed out in a, another presentation, uh, there was an a, a, um, image that was transmitted back from the moon of uh, Stanislaus Lem, uh, who um, kind of envisioned it, sort of, in that sense. So this is how the system works on the, the uh, so box hanging out the the side of the probe. There are two very large telescopes, one reasonably large and the other one, the Mount Palomar Hale Telescope, which are used as uh, a, a, a test bed for this thing. So this Table Mountain Telescope emits a beam of light, the probe locks onto it, and then it transmits. And it's not connected to the probe for anything other than power. It doesn't know what's going on inside the probe. It's not transmitting any useful data. It's just a technology demonstration. Down here, this is a technology demonstration by itself. This is a superconducting nanowire detector that detects a small number of photons coming back uh, from the probe. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if Haristo Poa, uh, Jinkuya Barzo, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the Ukrainian. <laughs> That's it. Done. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a couple of comments very briefly. Is that okay if I speak? Yeah, I, I, I guess so. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Bardis and uh, Professor Harchenko for letting us in and uh, having this wonderful opportunity to present this vision of the future uh, most significant engineering project uh, which we are planning to do. And we apologize for some glitches and so, for some delays. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I also I would like to mention that uh, we invited outstanding people from all over the world. And uh, we are happy to have uh, Ray Garboski, yeah? uh, who is uh, our friend and collaborator for, for many, many years. And as I said, uh, I see this uh, construction of a uh, future space civilization as a biggest engineering project. And uh, uh, we have some components which are already available to us. Uh, let's not forget about the essence of the desert conference, uh, when we are ready not only for heavy successes, but we are also predicting failures. So, you know, if like with any engineering project, we have to make sure that uh, something may go wrong. So we are not only qualified as engineers, but we are also qualified as <laughs> experts in space uh, uh, failures and uh, security and safety. 
Uh, Ray uh, is an outstanding person for many, many reasons. One of them is uh, that uh, he used to be the member of the NASA Department of Defense uh, okay. teamwork, which uh, which uh, was essentially given a mission of creating creating a new uh, space civilization. Unfortunately, President Kennedy was not around and the project was dropped, so we can continue with his experience. Another thing what I wanted to mention about Ray is he has uh, invented uh, the notion of the uh, supreme engineering, which he called wellness engineering. This is something which have been published, which is ready to go. Uh, as I said, we have many components to make this uh, idea of uh, space civilization uh, reality and not just uh, an academic discussion. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much once again, Professor Bardis and uh, Professor Harchenko. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And dear colleagues, maybe uh, you would like to add to uh, ask, um, please, we have not a lot, not a lot of time, but um, welcome. Welcome, Artyom. Artyom uh, thank you. Thank you for this really interesting report. And it's uh, really fantastic. And uh, it's necessary to bring this uh, ideas uh, to reality. But uh, it's interesting to mention the possibility of the reaction with helium-3 and in form of H3 and D, uh, in addition to mention uh, DT and DD reaction, because it's most promising source of energy while we're talking about the space, because it's uh, not producing the neutron uh, and uh, other kind of uh, uh, additional radiation, and it's necessary to take in into account because it's really most promising source of energy for uh, some space applications. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, it it um, has one drawback, however, which is that it requires substantially more uh, confinement density temperature product than it does uh, the, the, the DT or the, even the DD reaction. And we're just barely getting, you know, next few years to say we have gotten to this basic limits on the lower side of, of what it takes to make the DT reaction work. So, yeah, P boron 11 and, and uh, the helium 3 uh, reactions are. Uh, are promising in the future, but that's not immediate. That's, you know, can take some time. Now, the people have, have hypothesized and maybe even proven in some sense that there may be helium-3 available in some places in, in, uh, on the moon, for instance, and uh, yeah. other places because of uh, bombardment by, by cosmic rays. And uh, so that might be useful from that standpoint too. Yeah. For future at moon, right? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I see a lot of questions, a lot of maybe comments, but I would like to invite all our participants, but I ask you to be very shortly. Okay. Uh, Irina Leroy, welcome. Uh, hello, it's uh, Irina Leroy speaking. I just want to really thank you to all of you for making this uh, conference, uh, not only this conference happen, but also be able to invite such a such a great speakers. And what I particularly would like to thank you that uh, for your connection between Greece and history to the current um, current technology, uh, because I do believe that uh, many things that we have around us right now, even physically, coming from that patient that was previously, and from this mystery that was uh, in the Greek methodology, uh, that also was spread around the Europe as a part of our culture even nowadays. So just want to really highly appreciate your um, your connection to, to, to that part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Leroy. 